We pause to be still. Our silence professing you are the Lord God, our King of the universe. We open our hearts and our minds and our ears to be alert and receive your word. May the words of my mouth and the meditation of our minds stir our hearts and restore us as a people who keep company with you. In Jesus' name, amen. Please sit down. Thank you. Okay, so we're at the sixth week in our move through this little story, historical, archaeological. There are a few guests here, and this, of course, is Jonah and the whale, and quite often it's seen as allegory and a nice fairy tale. I saw an article just Friday. Another fellow off the coast of Sweden, swallowed by a whale, able to breathe inside. Of course, it stank to high heaven, but he was spit out and lived to tell about it. It just takes a quick Google search to find that Actually, if there is one miracle with Jonah and this whale, it's the timing that the whale was there and the timing that the whale took him right back to where he started at Joppa. We're going to look at chapter 3, verse 4 to 10, the turning point in the whole book, where this city miraculously in one day turns. For those who haven't been with us, the framing of the story God makes this call on Jonah. He wants nothing to do with it. He heads down to Joppa, heads down to the boat, gets in a boat headed for Tarshish, a town on the Atlantic side of Gibraltar in what we now know as Spain, what he knew as being the very end of the world. Jonah is on this boat with these pagan sailors. A storm comes. It goes bananas. They have to throw their cargo overboard, hoping that they won't sink and drown. And finally, they draw lots to see who has made the gods angry. And it's Jonah. And he confesses the living God. They don't want to throw him over. The pagan people act more like God's people than God's people. But he says, you have to. They throw him in the water. Boom, the storm stops. The fish shows up. And then Jonah, sitting inside there, bleached white after three days of stomach bile, etc. God, he would have stunk. Oh, I can't stand the smell of fish in a bin the next day. Imagine. Oh. And he repents. Doesn't say he's happy about it but gets spit up right on the beach where he left at Joppa and says he'll go and starts that long travel across the Fertile Crescent over to what we now know as Iraq and the city of Mosul, which is where Nineveh was, literally adjacent to Mosul. Last week, Eric talked to us that and he compared chapter 1 and chapter 3, those first three verses, call, response, and action. And today we look at Nineveh repenting, and next week, Jonah's response to Nineveh repenting, and we close the book. This was Eric's three verses, that very same structure as chapter one. The literary tools used in antiquity were much more complex than today. If you remember the week that Shane taught, once upon a, they lived happily ever That's about as complex as we get. (laughs) They use these word plays and these structure plays all the time to make a point. I want to give you the bottom line. What I want you to walk out of at the end of this so that you know exactly the points that need to come out of this passage. Just a few little verses that are packed with so much for us. And I'm going to pause right here and say hello to Father Andrew in London. This priest in London at Battersea who's been watching our series. Go figure. (laughs) Maybe Shane, maybe Rowena, maybe Eric, but... (laughs) But this is the points to walk out with. So let's look at the passage. Jonah began by going one day's journey into the city. Now, this, when you look at the original languages, Jonah started at the gate, and when he walked through the gates, he started preaching his message. He preached for one day, not a campaign, 
Not a PowerPoint, not pre-printed brochures, not TED Talks, not seminars of question and answer. He preached for one day giving the message from God. He cried out 40 more days and Nineveh will be overthrown. This is a fascinating passage here because what it doesn't tell you is quite often it gives you the detail of what is prayed or what is said or what is proclaimed. They give us one sentence, an emphasis of the author to take us off of Jonah that, hey, it wasn't about his TED talk. It was about the spirit of God moving. He uses that term 40 days more and the city will be overthrown. 40 days is significant in scripture. It starts with Noah. There were several 40s there. You come to the New Testament, Jesus in 40 days in the wilderness. And multiple times, it is an omen of destruction or an omen of change or an omen of setting yourself aside to God. It is the very same word overthrown that is used in Genesis 18 and 19, except we translate into English, will be destroyed. We know the end of the story. But it's the very same word, hapach. Come on, say it with me. Let's get Pentecostal. Hapach. Come on. Hapach. No, you guys got to do this with me. You're acting like Anglican. Stop it. <laughs> Ready? One, two, three. Hapach. Yeah, you kind of got to, like you're cleaning your throat out in the winter. All right, now, this word is a fascinating word. It's a literary, again, play by the author. In other places in scripture, besides being overthrown to destroy, it is repent and change. Repent being a fancy word that means turn. When you're in a hole, stop digging. This same word is used multiple times through the Old Testament, but they translate it to our language so far separated to the context. So we miss the play in the literary artistic tool that is using 40 more days and Nineveh will be destroyed, or 40 more days, and Nineveh will be changed, and it will turn. Beautiful pun, play on the words. It's the very same concept when Mark writes his biography of Jesus. Repent and believe. We've been conditioned in our minds by some shabby preaching, to be honest, that repent is to be sad and cry and wail and tell God a thousand times that you're sorry. That's often behind why people can't forgive themselves. They've been told that that's what repent means. Repent means to turn, to stop, to reconsider, to reevaluate and come to a different conclusion. When one is digging and finds oneself in a hole, one should stop digging. And believe. We account believing as giving mental assent, agreeing that these facts are true. Lucifer and a third of the angelic hosts we call demons now, all believe and know the fact that Jesus is Lord. They all would acknowledge the Nicene Creed. They're not going to be there on the great day. They're not going to be with us in eternity. It is not agreeing with the facts that saves someone. Turn and follow. Turn and live a different way. This past Wednesday, being a good youth pastor, Josiah wanted them to have the gospel, but he knew this could be dangerous. Vicar, you go first. <laughs> so I came in and talked to him about it. And you could see eyes awaken when I talked about to repent is just to turn and believe is just to follow that we actually have a life and a purpose in ourselves. The people of Nineveh believed God. That word believe is believe in. Ya'imanu. Come on, let's get Pentecostal. Ya'imanu. Say it with me. Ya'imanu. Ya'imanu is this word that has this concept of not agree with the facts, not have your arm behind your back and twist and say, uncle, it's a turning and embracing and taking on to oneself. Believe in God. Now you have to remember, the Ninevites, well, I can get away with this. The Ninevites were like Yanks. Optimistic, 
self-assured, accomplished, innovative, make it happen, build big things. And they believed in a message from a prophet from Israel, one of the people they're about to crush in the future. He's a peasant. He's bleached white. His hair may have fallen out. He probably still stinks. You ever try to get fish off here? And he's a nobody. They would conquer a city and taunt the military and ruling class of the city before they tortured them and executed them. Then they would write about how they took such joy in peeling the skin off their live bodies. These were not good people. And they believed in one day with one message. There's no answer to that. They weren't convinced with slickness. And it's interesting that in our day, in the Western church, we quite often are more assured of presenting a little plastic Jesus on the dashboard that's acceptable and approved and not offensive to a world that is still enemies with God. I'm not saying be a... I won't say it. Don't be a dork. But in your winsomeness... Don't compromise the truth of the gospel because it's not our TED talk that convinces them. It's the Holy Spirit that turns people to follow the living God. A fast was proclaimed and all of them from greatest to the least put on sackcloth. Amazing thing happened here. From the groundwork, an extemporaneous rise of the people, poor or wealthy, began to demonstrate and live out the experience of repenting by putting on sackcloth. Now I'm going to talk a little bit more about the sackcloth in just a minute. If you think about this one day walking through this city, which would take five days to walk the length of and three days to walk across, he just went one day. Which meant that most of the people got this news, even if they got word and were trying to come, and where is he now, and they're trying to predict where he is so they can get there ahead of him. A portion of the people are going to hear, which means most of them got it secondhand, including the king. The king got the news secondhand, and he believed. Power does not like a message which exposes it and leaves it wanting. This was the ultimate in power. The absolute ultimate in power. This is the same culture that a king's queen would never even present herself in his presence unless she had been called for. When it reached the king, he rose from his throne, took off his royal robes, covered himself with sackcloth, and sat down in the dust. I want you to notice, you remember Shane often exposes the literary structure, which is so precise in scripture, this chiastic model. He got up, he took off, he put on, he sat down. Two mirrored in the next two. He rose up. He got up from his throne. Kings did not stand. He got up and took off his royal robes. He took off his identity. He took off his power. He took off his self-confidence. The people didn't argue and mitigate and try to justify. But we, we can, we are. They just repented, including their king. He covered himself with sackcloth and sat down in the dust or ashes. The dust or ashes is the word afar. Afar. To sit down in it and pour it on top of your head as was and is yet the custom in the Middle East. To cover yourself with the humility, the powerlessness, the no argument, no defense, to submit under to this turning. The sackcloth, how many of you have ever had my food bag? Suzanne's family's constantly giving it to us. We, we love it to be on. I eat pretty good, as you can tell. It comes with that insulation of that wool in those bags. And if you take it out, it's really rough. And if you've ever worn anything that's traditional old wool, not this beautiful merino stuff, it's itchy, it's hot, it's uncomfortable, and it was meant to be that way. 
They would put it on to remove all comfort from themselves to experience and live in the experience of their repenting and their mourning. In the summertime in Nineveh, it's so hot. I've been in places in the Middle East where you just have to try it once. You take an egg and we would cook it on the fender of a combat vehicle just to show we could hap- it could happen. And yes, then we would eat it. <laughs> and then he sat down in the dust. The king did that. The, the people would have been like, where's our pride? Where's our affirmation? And his modeling probably brought more of them to faith. It's the very same chiastic pattern with the concept of baptism. Traditionally, you'd put on a white robe. You would take off your identity. You would take off your power. You would take off your wealth. You would take off the tribe that you're a part of. No, I'm not talking about those kind of tribes. I'm talking about preppies or millennials or emos or whatever. You take off that identity of how you valued and saw yourself. And you'd put on that white robe of nothing, symbolizing the tunic of a slave, a servant, one who's not their own. And you would go, you go down into the water, being submitted to it. Paul writes that it is a dying to ourselves. Paul writes to the Romans. Present yourselves as living sacrifices. Climb up on the altar. You no longer have any rights. Your life is no longer your own. You rise up out of the water to a new life, a new identity, a new purpose. Those are just a few, five of the passages of literally dozens across the New Testament which reinforce and reiterate that. These people understood they were changing in who they were. Paul wrote to the Corinthians in his second letter, you're a new creation. The old is gone, the new has come. The old is gone, the new has come. In recent history, being afraid of what a lost world would think of us and wanting to be approved and affirmed by them as we've decreased God from God to a little plastic figure that's kind of cool, we're at a point where I'm standing in a shopping mall, one of the places I hate on the planet, but it was where I had to go to get a watch worked on. And here's a lady. What does those two cross lines mean? Well, actually, it would be the same as if you wore an electric chair or a guillotine. (laughs) But we don't say that. We need to understand that it's the power of the Holy Spirit, not a convincing and a winning of an argument that moves people to be saved. We face a challenge. I've been using this term recently. You can have the best stove on the planet. You can have the best central heating on the planet with the best delivery of gas and the pipes and the highest quality clean gas you want. You can turn it on full bore and the gas can just pour and fill the room. But unless you have a lit pilot light, You see, we so often are so worried about delivering the right TED Talk, having the right slick program, but it's the Holy Spirit that is the light that causes the fire in the turning. It's always been that way. Even in Western civilization, the Huguenots, the Moravians, the Great Awakening the first time, the Great Awakening the second time, The revival in the American Civil War, the Welsh revival of 1904, the awakening of the spirit being poured out on Azusa, even in Los Angeles, which is kind of like Nineveh. The Jesus movement of the late 60s and early 70s, and then in the early 80s, the charismatic renewal lighting. And it always started with the simplest of people in the simplest of places. A movement that we now know as Vineyard was started by a guy named John Wimber who would just take his Bible, wear his cool leather sandals that we now call Jesus sandals, and he would go down to the beach with the surfers and hang out with them there in Southern California and tell them about Jesus. And it lit. Imagine the next one. 
in the 21st century where communication is instant, spreading like fire across the world. Never before have so many vaccines been developed so quickly at one time because of the collaboration of scientists and medical people around the world. What will it be like for the next global awakening? And how will New Zealand respond? Or will the pilot light be located here? When that spirit comes and is poured out, people become new creations. The old is gone. The power is from God. Look at the verse. Don't look at me. The power is from God who reconciled us and gave us that understanding, that ability, and turn the hardest of hearts. I spent a lot of time in denial, and then even when I knew it was true, I was like one of the demons. Yeah, no, nah, I'm not having any of it. I don't want to follow. I don't want to repent. I don't care. It was the spirit that turned me one night in a matter of seconds. And he has committed to us the message of reconciliation. God has given the church a message. This was the message to Israel. You will be a light to the world. And they quit being a light. The pagan sailors came to discover the living God, not because of anything Jonah did or said. And they made vows to that God. The people of Nineveh, in one day, with one message, turn, repent, and begin to follow. Interesting bit of history here. The Ninevites, I'm not using this lightly, but you'll relate. Well, they're a bit like Anglicans and Catholics. They keep real good records. They were better than Anglicans and Catholics. They were like the Nazis. They kept really good records of even all the stuff they shouldn't have kept records of. They made these carvings in stone of their very elaborate language, these pillars that told these stories, which is why we know so much about them. Except this era right here. For about 80 years prior and about 20 years after, when the next generation came up and went back to their arrogance and their power and their evil and destroyed 10 of the 12 tribes of Israel called the lost tribes because they were so thorough in scattering them, they completely lost their identity of even what tribe they were a part of. Just a question. A people who were so detailed, so educated, so exact, so proud... Why do we have very little of these stone reliefs from a few generations before and one generation after? Did their repentance lead them to actually take down these symbols of evil and sin and to not identify themselves from that anymore? That's change. leaders in our own history who we actually ought to be ashamed of. Growing up in New Orleans, this very French city was filled. It is, the New Orleans football team is called the Saints because there are more statues of saints in that city than any other city, including New York and North America. There are also a number of statues of people from an era who should not have been up. And the fight over several years to take those down was ugly because the city has not repented and believed. When God saw what they did and how they turned from their evil ways, he relented and did not bring on them the destruction he had. When they repented and when they followed... When they repented and they followed, God saw the sincerity. The king had said, let us do this. Maybe he won't destroy us. And God saw it. This big theological comes up, which theological argument comes up, which causes me to roll my eyes. Does that mean God changes his mind? Forty days until Nineveh is destroyed or 40 days until it changes direction? But they did repent, they did believe, and God did not destroy them. For us, we have to remember that we are not agents of our salvation. 
back in this era where we like to make Jesus's message acceptable, where people aren't faced with their sin, they're not faced with what is actually shame, and they don't surrender and not be shamed, but be re-identified and restoried and brought alive, not shamed, not caught and left in the mistakes of the past or anyone else's mistakes but a new identity. And we don't do it because we all know we can't do it. But that's left our message in the past several decades in the church in the West. We need to remember that it's God's doing to save us, not just what Jesus accomplished. But if you study the scripture, they've all turned away. None seeks after God. It's the work of the Spirit to even turn our hearts and to give us that ability to do so. And Just like that other passage, for we are God's handiwork, created in Christ Jesus to do good works, which God prepared in advance for us to do. That we are redeemed, like the people of Israel. No special identity, no skills, no wealth, no power, no nothing. He said, through you, I'm going to bring light to the world. I'm going to bring salvation to the world. You're going to be a light to the world. We've been given this ministry of reconciliation that makes us different when the pilot light is lit. Logan, my middle son, my kids love how much I tell stories on them. I at least ask my wife's permission. When he was four, I had to cut the grass every week. And Logan wanted to help daddy. He was a daddy boy from the hour he was born. And his little arms would barely reach the bar of the lawnmower. And he would come out there and he would walk in front of me and I would hold it and guide it. And he, I helping, hey daddy, I helping. We all know I could have gotten the grass done in about one third the time. I wouldn't trade it for nothing. I brought the story up to him this week. He has no memory of it, but he has an emotional memory of it. And you have to understand God's heart. His mercies are new every morning. We are pardoned. We're free. We were born for a purpose, not for destruction. We were born to be the light of the world, a light to the world, a light in the world, salt, a sweet fragrance of Christ to a world that doesn't know him. Look around. Logan was funny. The next year, I do it, Daddy. Okay, well, I'll get you a lawnmower and you can help. The little plastic thing that follows behind you, always making sure the blower side is away from your kid. So he, you know, you know teaching, Logan follows the rules. So that's what he does. I wouldn't trade it for anything. I wouldn't trade those times of doing it with him. And that's God's heart. Because to be honest, I don't know why he partners with us. We're a lot like Jonah. But he does and he wants to. Not because we have something, not because we bring something other than a willingness to be good company for and with him. And he changed. I want to go back to that passage real quick. And he changed him. You can always tell when the pilot light is lit and when it's not. People in the Western church love to say, but I said the prayer. Big degree in God right here. Really big degree in God. The prayer is not in Scripture. That prayer that you're supposed to say to become a Christian is not there. It's a great idea. It kind of marks it like a graduation or a wedding day. But that couple has moved towards that union long before they get to that day. It's a great idea. It's a great idea to say it in words. It's a great idea to posture it with your life and to connect with God experientially. But I actually don't need to know if anybody prayed the prayer. I just need to look and see if the pilot light is lit. When you look at those first couple of verses, we all go to sexual immorality and debauchery, idolatry, anything that's more important than God. But check out some of the other words. Hatred, discord, jealousy, selfish ambition. Dissensions, fractions, and envy, and the like. 
There's how I know when I see somebody who claims to be a Christian if the pilot light is lit. Those with gray hair, do you remember Promise Keepers? Do you remember when it hit the zenith? I had been living in Europe. I went to the United States. I was going to go to Seattle. But as soon as I got back, one of the guys who had invested in me spiritually when we lived in Europe was back as well. And he goes, come with me to Promise Keepers. And I was like, what's that? Just come. It's for men. For you, I'll go. I showed up. Amazing one day, right? And you know, anybody ever struck to pray or, or strived and fail to pray for even like 15 minutes? I'll just put it this way. I left and drove from Houston back to New Orleans six hours and don't remember any of the drive because I had no problem praying the whole six hours. I tell you about Promise Keepers, though, because I was in the queue for registration. And there was a fellow who was much taller than me, like Josiah Tall, shoulders this big, wearing solid black with a red cincture around the side. Fancy name for a sash-type belt. You've seen the dress. I've got one in there. If you haven't, come in. I'll let you put it on. And as I started chatting with him, he looked at me totally condescending, totally constantly speaking from his power and his position and his accomplishment. I didn't have the words for it, but I knew what I experienced. No pilot light. And he was a bishop. But the fruit of the Spirit, the fruit that is produced when something is alive, functioning the way it should function, it's easy to recognize. Love. You remember that little passage? Everybody has it at their wedding, right? Love is kind. Love is patient. Love does not seek its own. Love always loves. Joy, peace, forbearance. You remember me telling you about the slate roof tile 200 years old hanging in my bathroom with it written on there? A friend is one who sees to the act and still enjoys the show. We put up with each other, Right? We bear with one another. Kindness, goodness, faithfulness, gentleness. Such things, there's no law. But we live by the Spirit. The pilot light lit, changed and different. Not because we're slick or cool. He saw their repentance and did not destroy them. I showed you that list at the beginning. I show it to you at the end with that one line. The prophecy of Jonah. Jonah's words, it's the only prophet in all of Scripture, as I told you, who was sent to non-Jewish people. The only prophet sent to Gentiles. The only prophet sent to Gentile meaning dog. The only prophet not to God's people. And he hated it. He didn't want to go. The good news was for God's people, not those. Wait till you see his reaction to their repentance next week. Read ahead. You're allowed. But the book of Jonah, of this experience, is not actually to the Ninevites. This story, anchored in history, is actually to Israel. Jonah is the archetype of you. You're supposed to be light and it's the sailors and the Ninevites who actually turned and gave me their hearts. You didn't. You don't. You won't. And it's a prophecy to the church of the past two millennia. A prophecy to the church that we're actually not all that. But the Holy Spirit pouring through us and the evidence of that spirit is pretty easy to see, and that we are actually, like Jonah, to be a light of hope to the world empowered by the Holy Spirit with that pilot light lit. Let's pray. Loving God, how much of our painful circumstance, individually as a church, as the church, the church in the West. It's because we want to go to Tarshish. 
and we won't turn and follow. Spirit, light the pilot light in our hearts and change us. Give us a love for you. Give us pliable hearts and wills that our life would reflect you. That we would be a light to the world, salt, a fragrance. That we would bring our ministry of reconciliation to all those that are in our life be it school or work, neighborhood or family, a coffee barista around the corner. May they taste and see that you're good. May they recognize the heat of the fire and be drawn to you. Lord God, King of the universe, our God, we in this congregation and this church, we choose to live in hope and love and act as you lead. Fill us with the Spirit. Come, Holy Spirit. Be a light. Heal. Help. Bring our community and our city and our country to life again. God, we pray and ask for revival in our land. Revival in your church. In this time when information moves like a wildfire. But only you can turn the hearts of your church. Only your spirit can turn the hearts of people. But you've done it again and again. Your mercies are ever new and you so long to cut the lawn with us. We hold our hands open for what you have for us. We ask you to fill us with a compelling love that we cannot contain. As scripture says, if we held it and did not share it, it would burn our very bones. God, don't give us a TED Talk. Give us Holy Spirit power. In Jesus' name, amen.